So the next revision of the TNC is here. What's it like compared to the previous version? Here's a first look at these new little powerhouses. Unfortunately, I ran out of time for a gag this week. I did a lot of testing on these Teensies and I ran into a couple of issues. I've included most of the tests in this video, but we'll publish another video later on. So let's get into it. I have to say, the Poor Stoffrican's campaign is probably the best example of how to conduct a Kickstarter. His campaign launched in mid-August 2016 and was 3,700% funded four weeks later. No surprises there. The reason why it was successful wasn't because of the numbers, but because, one, he understood the effort required to pull it off, two, he delivered on his promise, and three, he communicated frequently. You just have to look through all his Kickstarter updates to see that Paul really had everything under control. That's not a celebration dinner. Come on guys, you deserve much better than that. So, I got my hands on the two new Teensies, commonly known as the K66 and the K64. These are an ARM Cortex M4 MCU, which contain, amongst other things, basic DSP support. These are some really nice MCUs. There's also a number of features that are common to both boards that just leave the previous Teensies look like real wimps. The K66 is a bigger brother of the two boards, running at 180 MHz with 1 MB flash and 256K RAM, and a bucket load of extras. No need for any expansion boards as it has it all whilst the K64 runs at 120MHz with less flash and RAM, but is 5V tolerant on all pins. What would have been nice is to see some LiPo battery management circuitry, but I guess it just couldn't all fit in. Both boards are much bigger compared to the previous Teensies, and look almost identical to each other, the only two obvious differences being a couple of additional components on the 3.6. If you're worried about backwards compatibility, both boards are pin for pin compatible with the previous versions. Paul has pushed out as many GPIO pins as possible onto a standard through hole spacing and provided any extras as SMD pads. The one nice obvious feature is the addition of an SD card slot, which isn't one of those push remove types. You know the ones I'm talking about, the ones that cause your SD card to fly across the room, never to be seen again. The other obvious difference is the MCU package that was used. The old Teensy MCU was an SMD component. SMD components are pins coming out the side of the package, which are soldered to the PCB. Since the pins are small and relatively long, they allow for a lot of flex between component and PCB. Whereas the new Teensy is using a BGA package, or ball grid array. If you look closely, you can see how it is mounted to the PCB. This is a bit of a problem. A BGA is a way of soldering a component with many, many pins to a PCB efficiently. It is different to SMD components in that all the pins are located underneath the package. One of the biggest issues with a BGA is that it doesn't flex at all. Also, there is a thermal expansion rate difference between PCB and package. So PCB flex and thermal changes can lead to pins breaking off and tearing PCB tracks with it. One way of reducing this problem is to squirt flexible adhesive under the BGA after soldering. Oh come on guys, really? Oi, stop it! The move from SMD to BGA is a bold step for the Teensy, and if you're not careful, you might see the MCU peel off the board. So, let's get on to testing. If you want to use it under the Arduino IDE, then head over to Paul's website and download Teensy Duino. Installation is a simple process. If you're running a Mac, open up the Teensy Duino disk image and run the install application. Of course, the usual warnings pop up. Does anyone really read them? Once the installer has started, click Next and then select the directory that contains your Arduino IDE installation. It'll be under the Applications directory on the Mac. Click Next, then select what additional libraries you want installed. Click Next and then Install. I just selected to install all the libraries but this turned out to be a problem for me later, which resulted in me having to reinstall the Arduino IDE from scratch. Then, gracefully ignore the instructions on what to do next and click Done. Then fire up the Arduino IDE, select the Tools menu, and you should see the new Tensi Duino boards there. Once selected, you have all the usual options available to the Tensi. So, first up, I did some CPU testing. Not only do we have an FPU on board, but the clock speed is significantly faster. 
I ran a whetstone and dry stone tests on the 3.5 and also on a 3.0 for comparison. The 3.5 came up with a respectable 94 MIPS for the whetstone test and 108 MIPS for the dry stone test. Nice! Notice it took 2 seconds to run on the whetstone and 5 seconds for the dry stone test. Comparing this to the TNC 3.0, I didn't really have a 3.2 on me at the time. You can see just how much faster it is. <sighs> okay, let's speed this up. It's way too slow. Oh, look at that. Only 5 whetstone MIPS taking 39 seconds to complete and 47 dry stone MIPS taking 12 seconds. That equates to an 18 times performance boost over the TNC 3.0, which comes as no surprise as not only is it faster, but contains an FPU. The dry stone performance was only 2.3 times fast, because the only advantage over the 3.0 was CPU speed. Comparing the speed of the TNC 3.5 and the 3.0, yep, it's about right. So, what about all these GPIOs? Let's get out my handy dandy Max 7219. Yeah, okay, I mean really, did we expect it to not work? What about some more complicated SPI tests? A 1.8 inch TFT screen for this, which is based on the ST7735R chipset. I modified Adafruit's demo code to run through a cycle of tests and display how long it took. The TNZ 3.5 was regularly cycling through every 5.26 seconds. Whilst on the TNZ 3.0, things were a little sluggish at 6.5 seconds. Note that I didn't crank up the SPI bus speed to the maximum possible. This is something for a review update. The display rotation test showed the same result completing in 3.1 seconds for the new Tenzi, whilst the old Tenzi was a little slower at 4.3 seconds. Not a huge difference, but once again I'd expect the Tenzi 3.5 to be able to crank up the SPI bus speed. So what about some WiFi speeds? I had a Seed FI250 based Arduino shield for this. Wrote some quick code to dump the contents of flash memory out to TCP port 9090 and measured the throughput. Yeah, okay, well that wasn't really a good test because the FI250 is a UART based board, which means a maximum board rate of 115200, which, no surprise here, is the max transfer rate we're seeing. Okay, look, it works, but forget that test. Since we have a beefy FPU on board, let's put it to some use. I used an I2C based 9DOF IMU and used the RT IMU Lib2 library. This library provides proper fusion of accelerometer, gyroscope and magnetometer data. I was able to get IMU fusion data at around 200Hz, even though it was unoptimized code. It was fantastic compared to the 50Hz sample rate of the Tenzi. Next on to audio. The Tensi Audio Library is a great piece of work. You can define multiple inputs, outputs, filters, analyzers, and processing objects. Really cool stuff. For example, you can do some speedy, fast Fourier transforms. And even set it up as a USB audio device. If you do, make sure that you set the USB type appropriately. This code makes the Tensi a simple USB audio out device. Just select the right sound device on your PC or Mac and play your music or video. Simple. You can also set it as a USB audio input device. I modified the drum machine example to output audio over USB. A little funky, but it's certainly a drum machine. You can also create a number of filter effects on the Teensy. I created a simple program that would apply the chorus effect on the left channel and flange effect on the right channel. It worked without issue. Although at some point during my testing there was a huge amount of distortion. This only happened once and I never got to the bottom of why that happened. Paul provides a great tool that visualizes your audio objects. Just copy the code from the Arduino ID, go to the website, and click on import and paste it in. There you go, pretty cool eh? It'll even provide some help of each object. With the Teensy you can even create a fully fledged mp3 player that plays from the SD card. Well, 
It seems that there were some issues and SD support on the new TNCs isn't quite complete. I wasn't able to use the SD libraries along with the TNC audio library. This is something for further investigation. Remember the TNC Duino install process? Only select the libraries you really need, otherwise you'll see errors like this. Moving the SD library manually aside, seems that the TNC Duino SD library was having issues with 1.611 of the Arduino IDE. I never got to the bottom of this one, but remember it's still in beta, so it'll be sorted out fairly quickly. So, can you actually access the SD card on the new Teensies? Well, there's already support from a bunch of alternative libraries, just not the main Arduino SD library. For example, USDFS is a good library to use, but this one doesn't support block streaming. This means that writing small files to an SD card will be very slow, but good enough for testing. This library contains a good performance tester. On smaller block sizes, of course, the transfer rates were very slow, but on larger block sizes came close to the true speed of transfer. So a pretty decent library if you're thinking of using large file writes. The other option is to use the excellent SDFAT library from Greenman, which is a drop-in replacement for the standard SD library and has proper blocking support for SD cards, so is efficient with both small and large writes. Just note that this library has some issues when using it with the TNC Sound Library. Basically, it doesn't work. Using the TNC SDIO demo example, it came up with a fairly respectable 15 megabytes per second. Once the library becomes more mature, it'll be the one to use. So what do I think of the new TNCs? Well, they're a major step up from the previous version. The new MCUs are so packed full of features that they will quickly become the standard go-to board to make really anything. TNZ support is outstanding, and really, the TNZ is to the Arduino world what the Raspberry Pi is to the SPC world. A couple of issues I found with them were the use of BGA packages, and some of the libraries aren't fully there yet. I'll have more on the TNZs in a follow-up video, so stay tuned for that. If you enjoy this video, then don't forget to like, and if you want to see more videos like this, then you can now support me on Patreon. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next week.